I'm Tony Katzer, the CEO of the IIB Tech Lab. We've teamed up with Markitecture to celebrate the Tech Lab's 10th anniversary by highlighting some of its most impactful work and the dedicated members who make it all possible. Please join us in celebrating our 10th anniversary at Tech Lab Summit on June 11th and 12th in New York City, where we'll be discussing the future of these standards and more topics, including artificial intelligence, the future of privacy, connected television, cross-environment measurement, and so much more. We hope you enjoy the series and look forward to the next 10 years. Welcome to Architecture, where you can get smart fast with in-depth interviews of leading technology vendors. This is one in a series of interviews conducted in partnership with the IAB Tech Lab to celebrate that organization's 10-year anniversary. In these interviews, we learn about the history and impact of some of the Tech Lab's most impactful work. And this is a strange one because I'm being interviewed. This is Ari Paparo. I'm here with Tony Katzer of the IAB Tech Lab. And Tony's going to interview me about the origins of the VAST standard. So, Tony, it's up to you. You're in charge. Wow, all this pressure. Thank you, Ari, and thank you for hosting this podcast series leading up to our summit on June 11th and 12th. So we wanted to start with, as part of our foundational series, you know, core technical standards that drive the industry, a little-known fact that we consistently pull our audience on when we have our events is what standard kicked off the tech lab? And the majority of answers are incorrect in that everyone answers RTV. The majority of the room answers RTV. That is the wrong answer. The right answer is VAST, which is a standard created by you during your days at DoubleClick. So we figured we'd go right to the source and talk about how VAST came about. So you have already been indirectly part of many surveys that the Tech Lab has conducted that are... Right. <laughs> Glad to hear. Yeah, so VAST predates the Tech Lab, but sort of caused it to exist because, and we'll go through how the standard came about, but the story of the Tech Lab is that after VAST had been printed, adopted, et cetera, the quality of the original document is just not up to the current Tech Lab standards. So VAST 1 and VAST 2 are effectively written in a Word doc and published as a PDF. And I uh, I talked to Randall Rothenberg, who at the time was the president and CEO of the IB, and I basically gave him a piece of my mind that I felt like he was over-relying on volunteers. He needed to up-level the professionalism. He needed to get a budget, hire some technical writers. And in fact, I was saying that I did my best, but it wasn't very good. And out of that conversation, the Tech Lab was born. Yes. Again, quite a poignant story considering we're celebrating our 10-year anniversary that, yes, you are often credited by Randall and others for not just the VAST standard, but the creation of the IB <laughs> Tech Lab. <laughs> it's funny. So thank you, because without that, I probably wouldn't have a job, Ari. So I appreciate it. You talk about leveling up professionalism. I'm not quite sure what I'm doing here, but I'll take it as long as they'll let me uh, let me have it. You're unemployable, so we needed to create a nonprofit organization. It's, exactly. <laughs> so let's talk about the creation of it. You and I were both at DoubleClick when you worked on this, when you developed it. So I do have some inside baseball, but for our audience, talk about the inception of it. Why VAST? You know, what led up to this? And I think an interesting part of the story is also how you came into DoubleClick. And I think that also had something to do with why you created the VAST standard. Yeah, it was really strange coincidence in a sense, because I was brought into DoubleClick to run what was at the time called Rich Media or Motif. Mm -hmm. And that, for those who don't remember, was a separate category of tech about creatives and video. Video was just starting to appear inside ads. This is around 2004. And so I became effectively the emerging technology guy at DoubleClick. And people would come to me with all their cutting edge video stuff. So I, I started seeing how the video market was evolving. And there were really early adopters like CBS and Real Networks who were putting these postage stamp size video players on their websites and showing ads in them. It was all custom tech. Like there was no real good established solution for that. And the coincidence part, the thing that was interesting was that I, through various shifts in the management team, also started taking over a DFA, which now, which is now called Google Campaign Manager, which is the buy side ad server for DoubleClick. So I was the product manager for that. And my customers kept saying, we want to be involved in this video thing. How do we serve ads as a buyer into a video player? And I said to myself, well, you know, chocolate and peanut butter go together. I'm the video guy and the DFA guy. Maybe if we created an XML standard, and I'll go into why XML in a moment. If we created a standard sort of way to express a video ad, that would help both of my jobs because I could sell this technology to the sell side, the publishers who wanted the video player standardized, and I could create liquidity for the buyers who wanted to put their ads in the video player. 
And then, so I actually called up another guy, a guy who doesn't get enough credit, this fellow named Jeff Coco, who is currently at Critio, I think. Oh my he, gosh, Jeff. Jeff was my counterpart. Yeah. He was the head of Atlas, Rich Media. So he was like the guy who did video over at Atlas, which was the main competitor to DFA. And I said, hey, Jeff, and we probably should have had a lawyer in the room, but we didn't. I said, hey, Jeff, like, if you and I agree on the same XML standard, the two by far leading ad servers on the buy side, I bet the publishers will accept it and start taking our XML. And he's like, yeah, that's a good idea. And so that's how it started. Yeah, the Wild West of the early days of digital advertising, just think it up, make it happen, call your competitors and partners and, you know, no NDA, just figure it out. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Exactly. <laughs> So then I started show, then I started whiteboarding with my engineering team and they were like, Are you crazy? Like, why would we give this out? We serve we sell ad serving. We're not gonna have a standard. Then we won't be able to charge for it. And so that was a bit of a conversation, a couple I of remember. interesting conversations with Vlad and Igor and Drit and all those folks over at DoubleClick. But it started seeming like a pretty good idea. And I don't remember exactly how it happened, but at some how point. Did you get, how did you get that over the hump? I recall those conversations. And, yeah. you know, there was some consideration that VAS was some technical advantage or technical differentiator. How did you make the argument that, hey, guys, this should be open source? Yeah, I think it was really the buy side because on the sell side, the publishers didn't really care that much about standardization. They actually kind of preferred to customize the way the ad server and their video player interacted to optimize it for however they did business. But you would never have interoperability if every single publisher had their own XML document. So the conversation about the buy side is where it really started getting traction, where folks started saying, well, if you want those agency dollars, you're going to have to open up at some point and accept tags from the buy side. And that's always a process. So the conversations were going, I don't recall exactly who was involved on either side, but at some point before it was published, Randall convinced me to do it within the auspices of the video committee of the IB, once again, pre-tech lab. So I had to go into a room with like 30 people who were mostly business people, not very technical, and convince them that this XML document made sense and that the fields that they needed were or were not in it. And it was a real process. Let's just say that. Yeah, I remember it went on for a bit, but then you made the convincing argument. <laughs> it was agreed that it should be open sourced. Once again, the tail wagging the dog, you know, the advertisers, the buy side, you know, basically seeing the value in this and starting to ask for it historically is what leads to adoption of many of our standards. So yeah, well done. But let's talk about the design of VAS for a bit. You mentioned earlier you were going to get into why XML. Why did you start with XML as the framework? Because at the time, the only video player anyone used was Flash, and Flash did not support JSON. That's why. It's a very simple reason. Yep. Yeah. So I don't quite recall. Was it initially, was it from the outset opened, or did we launch it? Did you launch it within the four walls of DoubleClick, and then it was donated? That part was fuzzy to me. No, I don't think so. I think we had maybe launched what was called DoubleClick Video, which was effectively something very similar, like the same ice cream, different flavor. Mm -hmm. So we were selling that as a publisher side product, and it was enabled people to basically do the basics of serving video. But then it eventually turned into Vast. So we had Vast 1 was published by the IB and, you know, comment period and then became adopted. And it wasn't really adopted. Like pretty much no one adopted it. Vast 1, it was a dud. There were some technical reasons that as soon as it left the committee and actual practitioners started using it, there were a couple of snags that made it kind of hard to do certain things. I don't want to call them bugs, but there were ways in which it was adopted that didn't make too much sense. And so it was maybe nine months later that we put out VAST 2 that fi more or less just fixed those problems. And that took off very rapidly. And that's when folks started implementing it, putting it on the roadmap and getting things going. So one interesting thing that happened, which was that I talked about the origin story about being on the buy side, the agencies wanting it, et cetera. And for years, no agencies adopted it whatsoever. When I say it was adopted very quickly by guess whom? Ad networks. So, <laughs> <laughs> so the tremors of the world and all the bright rolls, all those ad networks that were proliferating when video started getting adopted by consumers, 
they wanted to get inside the publisher's video players very badly, and Vast was the best thing that's ever happened to them. In, in a sense, those companies owe their liquidity to Vast mm -hmm. because otherwise, before Vast, they were like calling up the publisher and saying, you know, here's all this custom code you need to put into your video players and SDK and all that stuff, and Vast solved that problem. So for the first like couple of years of Vast 2, it had a big economic impact, but not the one I predicted or wanted. And basically DFA barely supported video for quite some time, and neither did Atlas. Neither of those companies made much of Vast for a couple of years because there was still hesitancy on the publisher side to just take tags from a buyer and not really know what was going to happen when the ad served. Traditional concern of publishers giving up some semblance of control, which they really weren't giving up control. It was actually helping buyers scale video buys across their publisher footprint. You know, one of the things you'd call out is adoption was really driven by the ad networks. You know, the ad networks, I think, get a bad rap, particularly ad network 1.0 1, 1 or even ad network 2.0 days. But that really was, I mean, sure, outside of the chicanery of arbitrage, et cetera. But that was really the proving ground for, I think, a lot of new things. Like that's where you could really experiment with new technologies, new standards, mm -hmm. And I, I think the ad networks are a bit underappreciated in terms of some of the innovations they led pre DSPs and, you know, how the programmatic ecosystem now has evolved. I think you, you see plenty of innovation and willingness to test in the DSP, SSP environments, but the ad networks are really the early testing grounds. Yeah, absolutely. They always push the envelope on creative formats, on data use, a lot of things. And in video, because it was really quite a bit behind the banner world, the programmatic side took longer to develop and the ad networks were the main source of liquidity for quite some time. Yep. I mean, we saw that with Index Exchange, you know, the, the, Casali, mm -hmm. the Casali network, you know, Andrew and the family have now evolved that into a premier programmatic player. You know, they started out as an ad network. So, yeah, I think they're underappreciated for the innovations that they partnered with the ecosystem on, for sure. Yeah. It's funny you mentioned Vast, too, because based on Tech Labs data, the industry is still predominantly on some flavor yeah, <laughs> too. it's predominantly 2.4, 2.6 is what we see based on our data. And I think some of the data that yeah. um, we've seen Sincero put out there as well. I, I know you, you haven't necessarily remained close to it, but as the, the godfather of Vast or the granddaddy of Vast, any thoughts on why we've kind of stalled on two, on some flavor of two? Three, three yeah. wasn't adopted at all. Four, we see some adoption of four, but any thoughts? Well, my, my stats were a little bit different. Last time I checked, it was two and three with no four. So let's talk about the differences. In two, one of the big assumptions is that the entire vast document is a single ad, meaning a single, call it a creative. It may have versions of the creative, but effectively, if you as a consumer watched all of the videos incorporated into a document, they'd be the same. And VAST 3 changed that and allowed for a pod of ads so you could have multiple creatives in a single VAST response. And that was actually a big request when I was doing VAST 2, and I really convinced people not to do that because it was too complicated and also it was ambiguous which ads should serve. I just didn't like it. So VAST 3 effectively, I think, now I'm throwing people under the bus, kind of solved a problem that didn't even need to be solved. It was more like a publisher ad serving problem rather than a liquidity problem. So I don't think there's any really good use case for VAST 3 on the buy side. It's more of a sell side use case. And then VAST 4 is really interesting because we have to go back now. So when VAST came out, Another spec came out almost at the exact same time that was much less reviewed called VPAID. Mm -hmm. And VPAID got kind of shoved into the IB by Yahoo because they wanted interactive ads. And VAST doesn't have interactivity necessarily. It could, but it's not really built for that. So VPAID was sort of this way you can have interactive JavaScript-like ads inside a video player. And everyone said, okay, that's a rare use case. We're never going to hear from VPAID again. The Yahoo guys just wanted it. And then what happened was that there was a movement, especially among ad networks, to prefer vPaid over Vast because vPaid allowed the verification vendors to run scripts and to tell fraud and viewability and stuff like that. Right. So I was hearing from people maybe 10 years ago that like Vast is dead. Everyone wants vPaid for everything. And then what happened, I know this is a long story, but it happened. No, is, this is great history. 
The scammers realized that if you're serving a VPaid ad, well, you can run an auction in it. And so you start having these fake ad networks who would buy an ad, say it was an advertiser for VPaid, and then run an RTB auction and resell it or resell it 10 times in a row. You'd have 10 ads in a single slot, and it became a pestilence on the industry because VPaid is inherently insecure, and you can just run anything you want. So VAST4 is supposed to solve that problem, which is VAST4 has the ability to include scripts in it. And that sounds great, but it's kind of complicated to implement. And I think that's one of the issues on adoption. But the whole VPaid thing is also waned. So I think people are more satisfied running VAST and VPaid is on a pretty rapid decline. Yeah, we've seen a significant decline in our data on VPaid where we've seen an uptick in VAST4. I think one of the other challenges with VAST4 was also we were forcing things like a creative ID, which mm. are not broadly adopted, whether it's at ID or some of the other international creative ID solutions, we force that into the spec. And again, if there's no creative ID to be used, then you couldn't, you effectively couldn't leverage VAST4. We've updated it since that we there's workarounds for that now to make it easier to use VAST4. But that I think was a big impediment to VAST4 adoption was that the creative IDs still are not preeminent in the video world. Unfortunately, we're working to solve that but I think that was also a big blocker to Makes adoption. Sense. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, there might be also a factor that more and more video is being served in app or in TV apps and where scripting is less important or undesirable in total. You have the OMSDK for measurement that can take care of it without a VPAID. Yeah, that's exactly right. I think the combination of, of VAS and OMSDK also eliminates the need for VPAID. And to your point, you know, there really isn't client side scripting, particularly in CTV environments. You, know, you can't really execute. JavaScript and the OEM television. So, yeah. Thoughts on the future of VAST? There's been some quiet calls in the industry to eliminate VAST altogether and move in another direction. I don't necessarily prescribe to that, but thoughts on future of VAST? I mean, we're seeing a tremendous amount of adoption of it in the CTV ecosystem, which is yeah. going to continue to you know explode. Um, where do you see the future of VAST going? Well, I think it's fair to say that it was developed for a slightly different time. I mentioned the XML thing, but also Vast was very, very assuming that there were companion ads because in the web environment, the typical environment was a video player with a banner on the side that was clickable. So maybe half of the weight of a Vast document is all these nodes about the side banner. And in a CTV environment, that just doesn't exist. There's no side banners anymore. So that's one thing. The other thing is there's more server-side ad inclusion than there used to be. In the original Vast days, everything was client-side because it's web browsers, but with live TV and high-quality videos, there's more server-side and server-side ad inclusion doesn't require as much flexibility because you're going to re-encode the mezzanine files in any case. And so Vast supports many variations of the same video for different sizes, and that's kind of maybe not as important as it used to be. So all that put together, you know, maybe there's a CTV, a modern CTV, slimmed down VAST 5 that's JSON and really simple. And maybe that's a good idea. I don't know. Really, we should ask the buyers and the sellers, right, the market participants, if the pain of a new standard is worth the simplicity. But VAST is still in use. It's the lingua franca of video ads. It's still the best solution for web-based video ads, even though it has some drawbacks for connected TV. And I'm interested in seeing where it goes. Yeah, we, we actually polled our members last year on this concept of a slimmed down version of VAST for CTV, and there didn't seem to be the appetite. The yeah. response was, it's good enough for government it work, works. so to speak. <laughs> it works like no team to adopt a new standard. We make it work even in the CTV. So I think it's here to stay. You know, again, there's been quiet calls to you know move to something else, but I think VAST just has a step, a very firm foothold in the industry as the de facto yeah. video standard. As long as I keep getting paid my one cent CPM royalty, I'm, Tony, I was going to ask your accounting department where's where's the check? I haven't seen it in a while. Uh, you're breaking up. You're breaking up. Sorry, can't, <laughs> can't quite hear you. This bad bad connection. Bad connection. Yeah. <laughs> On that note, thank you for the contribution, Ari. I mean, again, a, a huge reason that Tech Lab exists, not just for the VAST standard, but also your call for a more professional, technical approach to open standards for the ecosystem. We would not be here, candidly, without your uh, pounding on the table and asking for a Tech Lab. So thank you for that. Any final thoughts, comments on VAST or, or ecosystem or Tech Lab or what have you? I just think it's amazing how far video has come as an advertising medium because when I first really entered this industry in 2004 or five, we're postage size 
stamps. It was a novelty. There were only two or three publishers who could serve ads into video, and they weren't very good. And now, you know, the majority of our TV watching is digital, is addressable, much of it's programmatic. And it's like, you know, one standard after another of VAST plus OpenRTB, et cetera, has just enabled that. So it's pretty amazing evolution. Yeah, this trifecta of VAST, OpenRTB, the Open Measurement SDK, you've got a pretty comprehensive set of technical standards that support video across multiple environments. Yeah, you're talking about $30 billion in commerce, you know, growing. Yeah, pretty amazing. Well, thank you. Thank you for this, Ari. I, I hope you were comfortable having the the chair flipped interviewer to interview in your own podcast. But thank you, you forgot, for thank you for doing this. Yeah, but you forgot to ask the final question, the trademark question. If Vast was an animal, what animal would it be? <laughs> okay. If Vast was an animal, what animal would it be? I'm gonna go with chameleon because the whole nature of the format is that it can be adaptable to different video players, different video sizes, different capabilities. So the flexibility is kind of the why it was built the way it was. So let's go with Chameleon. Okay. Chameleon it is. I might go with uh, Honey Badger because it's, uh, oh. it, it's uh, <laughs> it, it, you, you can't kill it and uh, it's it's dependable and it's rock solid, but it does give a shit. I don't want to say Honey Badger don't give a shit, but Honey Badger in this case, <laughs> in this case it does. <laughs> I think this is a PG-13 podcast, so I think we can say that. It is now. Well, Ari, thank you again for your time. I look forward to seeing you at Tech Lab Summit, as well as all the listeners, June 11th and 12th in New York City. Absolutely. Thanks for doing this whole thing with us with all these Tech Lab interviews, and this one was a fun one. Yes, it was. Thanks so much. Thanks for listening. New interviews are added every week at Markitecture.tv and your favorite podcasting app.